Yeah, I got a little piece of eyebrow, okay? My life is in shambles right now. I only got a little piece of eyebrow. This is because I started filming and realized I didn't turn the mic on, so I had no audio, so I had to start over. But anyway, I was just telling the story of how I just lost about two days of my life. So this is the thing. I got an edible from somebody. And that somebody was like, you know, don't eat the whole thing. Just take you a piece. But mind you, mother has been on a diet, okay, for months. And so you can't just give me a rice crispy treat and be like don't eat the whole thing girl i'm not trying to get none of that i ate the whole thing okay in its entirety and it was delicious so i'm at home i started to feel a little bit i'm like okay i'm feeling a little a little something something baby there's something something escalated so fast so i'm like you know it's nighttime let me just get in bed play a little game on my phone until i fall asleep like that's the plan so I opened up the app on my phone to play a little card game and I'm just like waiting because you know how Uno, it'll count the other people down if they take too long to take their turn. So I'm just like, why is it taking so long for everybody to take their turn? I'm ready to play my cards. I got some good cards and nobody else is going. At this point, I'm starting to get a little irritated because I'm like, you know what? They're not even supposed to allow people to take this long to take their turn. What's going on? Why are these people not being counted down? Do you know? How long it took me to realize that I was playing solitary. Yeah. So at that point, I was just like, maybe it's probably best if I just close my eyes and not try to do anything that requires brain cells. I go to sleep. I wake up the next day and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm still in the red, like probably like red orange, but it's still pretty bad. So in my mind. I closed my eyes to sleep it off. Then I wake up and it's like five in the afternoon. The first time I woke up was 11.48 a.m. I wake up and Popeye's chicken is on my mind and I'm just like, oh, that sounds good. Like I should have some Popeye's chicken. I had like this flashback moment of me being in the Popeye's chicken line and the man at the window being like, why you look so mad? So I'm just like, I don't know what that's about. But let me just get up and take my butt to Popeye's. I get up and I look on my dresser and there's a Popeye's chicken box. Devoured, okay? Was a two-piece. Was. And I'm just like, did I really fucking go to Popeye's? Like, was that not a dream? I don't even remember answering him. So I probably looked all kind of crazy. Sitting there in the drive-thru. If I really did look mad. And he's like, why you look so mad? And I'm just not saying anything. I don't know how it went because I was there but I wasn't. I look at my call log. I didn't have a whole conversation with my auntie. I, I don't know what else I did. Like, honestly, can't tell you. Um, don't know. I had walked blue because he wouldn't have had it any other way. I look over at him and he looking at me like the Chloe meme. Like, he just judging. Like, girl, look at you. Blue really does. Like, I love my dog. He's so sweet, but he does have a real judgmental spirit on him. Like, it's crazy. The amount of sleep that I've gotten over the last couple days. Is insane but I feel like me again today 50 hours after the fact so yeah I didn't write out an opening for today's video because I've been trying to put the pieces of my life back together honestly you know what else happened 100,148 that is my current subscriber count so I love y'all so much thank you shout out to everybody who has ever liked shared my video shared my channel honey left a comment referred my channel to anybody all of y'all are the reason why I'm here today in 100k bars and all and I greatly appreciate it. Let's get into today's story. Today's story was requested by Jaleesa White. Honey, I hope between the two of those, one of them is the proper pronunciation. Today's story is a wild one. So let me just shut my mouth about everything else and get into the story. Ronald Bell Jr. descended from a long line of pastors. His father was a youth pastor. His grandfather was a pastor of a church. So he was very much involved and raised in the church. He was described as being very helpful, very kind. He was also described as being a people pleaser. Ronald was always very much more than willing to go above and beyond. Just help the people around him. Just the definition of people pleaser. That was him. He was a very good kid and also a good student. He did very well in school. He was on sports team. So between schoolwork, the sports, and the church, he didn't have much time for anything else. 
especially dating. So he had not had him a little girlfriend or any of the things until he got to high school. In high school, he was very popular. He was very well liked by not only the other students, but the teachers and the staff at the school also really admired him. Like he was just, just an overall good kid. Now he had no desire to follow in his grandfather's or his father's footsteps and become a pastor. Instead, he wanted to go to the Air Force and become an electrician. That was his goal, that was his aspiration in life. I also need to mention that he was born on April 1st, 1981, making him an Aries. It's another one during Aries season, yay. Baby, the Aries are giving the Pisces a run for their little money during Aries season, okay? In the summer of 1998, Ronald is now 17 years old. He meets Crystal, who is one year younger than him. She's 16 at the time. Born March 11th, this is a Pisces. A Pisces and Aries. Let me just say it can be a match made in hell, okay? Now Crystal, she had just moved into an apartment complex not far from where Ronald's house was. And she was kind of new to the area altogether. Nobody really knew anything about her when she first touched down. But she caught Ronald's eye and he was just like, she cute. The two run into each other a couple of times and he realized that this might she might actually be attracted to me as well. When he inquires about her, he expresses his interest and attraction for her to a friend. His friend is like, mm -mm, this is nothing but trouble. Apparently, in that little time that she had been there, she had already established a reputation as being like very rebellious, very wild, and just overall a rule breaker. Sis did not like to listen to her folks or anybody with a little piece of authority. She wanted to do what she wanted to do, nothing less, nothing more. So his friend is like, nah, just pass this one on up. He tells Ronald that he doesn't even feel like they would be a good match because Ronald is just like this high school church going athlete and sis is wild and rebellious. And so Ronald was still very much interested. He did not listen to his friend. He decides to pursue Crystal anyway and see if the two, you know, could hit it off. Now, Miss Crystal was being raised by her stepfather and her mother, who she just refused to follow their rules. Like, she just did not like their little setup in their house. She wanted to be able to come and go as she pleased. And so, for these reasons, she would often clash with her stepfather and her mother. Just as Ronald was attracted to Crystal, she was also very much attracted to him. He was this tall, athletic guy. He was the oldest of his siblings, so he had that whole protector vibe going on. That's something that she really, really liked about him and really drew her in. The two begin hanging out and then they begin dating, but his friends were not accepting of her like at all. They didn't like her. They felt like she was trouble and just not a good fit for Ronald at all. And with the reaction that he got from his friends, he was like, you know what? If they don't like sis, then my family, who was very conservative, very much in the church, they're really not gonna like her. So he decides at this point that the best thing for him to do is just keep her a secret. Like, don't even try to introduce her to the family. Don't try to bring her to church. For five months, the two date and nobody really knows about it except for his close friends and her friends. But he keeps it a secret from his family altogether. They have no idea that their son is out here dating anybody. And over the five months, Ronald saw a lot of what everybody was trying to warn him about and how she was so rebellious and a little bit of a wild child. But he felt like she just needed a good influence in her life. And like protection was a big thing between them. For whatever reason, she felt like she was lacking protection in her life. And he felt like if he could be that person that would be around and protect her, make her feel secure, she would let their guard down and she would stop acting out the way that she was. He had gotten to see a side of Crystal that he felt like everybody should get to see. Maybe I can soften her up a bit and she can open up and share this beautiful side of her that I get to see with everybody. Fast forward to five months into their relationship, Crystal has a fight with her parents. Now this fight with them results in them telling her, you know, if you just can't follow the rules, you need to go. And she leaves. She decides that she's going to go off on her own and do her own thing. She immediately goes to Ron and tells him about the incident and how she pretty much now has nowhere to live. Ronald immediately felt like 
he needed to fix it. Like he wanted to be the one to fix this for her and provide her a rapid solution. So he goes to his parents and tells them about this relationship and how, you know, he loves her. She's the one and asks if she could move in. His parents say, hell no, nah, she can't come here. Like, I don't know what she's going to do, but she can't come living up in here. So that was a bust. And because he's her man, he felt like it was his responsibility to find her somewhere that she could stay. He takes his money from a little summer job that he had had and he counts that up. It's hardly anything, but it's enough for either a couple of nights in a hotel or like a month's rent somewhere. So then he goes and decides he's going to look for a more longer term solution and see if somebody is renting out a room at an apartment because he knew, I mean, they're underage. They can't apply for an apartment. They come across an ad placed by a 31 year old Air Force vet by the name of Cordell Richards, who is looking to rent out a room at his apartment. Cordell had placed the ad because he had run into some financial issues on his own. He had this second bedroom that he was not using. And so he felt like what better way than to rent it out and make some extra money. Cordell meets with the two. He shows them the apartment and everything seems fine. He gets good vibes from them. They seem like just an average young couple. Cordell goes over the ground rules, which is nothing crazy or strict, just average expectations that you can expect from someone whose home you will be living in. They pay Cordell for the first month and she moves in right away. She is super happy for Ron coming through for her when she needed him. He is extremely happy at the fact that he was able to do so. They're hanging out at the apartment. Everything is fine at first. Crystal is loving the fact that she is somewhat on her own in her own place. She doesn't have a bunch of rules that she needs to follow. Her boyfriend or any other company that she had could come and go pretty much as they please. Crystal had, of course, never been on her own, so she never had this amount of freedom, and she was loving it. This was happy. She felt like, you know what? This is it. Everything was perfectly fine between them all until... Crystal began complaining to Ronald that when he wasn't around, Cordell would make sexual advances and like little flirty comments toward her. None of this had ever happened in the presence of Ronald. And he was very taken aback by it. He was kind of shocked to hear it, but he figured, you know, of course he would act a certain way around me. I'm her man. So of course he wouldn't show any kind of signs of being too flirtatious. Not long after this, Crystal begins complaining to Ronald that she is uncomfortable there that not only is he making like little comments here and there, he is now walking around in his underwear. He came in my room the other day with an animal print bikini bottom, like male bikini bottom on. And it's just, it's just very uncomfortable. She expresses to him that she's just always uncomfortable at home, but she needed somewhere to stay. So it's like, I feel like I have to put up with it because I need somewhere to stay. At the same time, I feel like he's doing this because he knows that I need somewhere to stay. Being her age, she felt like her only other option probably would be to go back to her parents' house. But for her, that wasn't an option. She was not wanting to do that. She enjoyed being out on her own and having that freedom more than anything. Furthermore, they don't have much money. She don't have no money at all. And Ronald has used the majority of his little summer savings on her first month. So finding another place, they felt like that kind of wasn't an option either. So they decided to go and get a deadbolt to put on the inside of her bedroom door. That way, when she was at home, she could just lock herself in. She doesn't have to worry or be uncomfortable or worry about him coming in in his drawers allegedly. According to Crystal, after this act that was supposed to result in her feeling a lot more comfortable in the home that she was sharing with Cordell, it just kind of made things worse because she said that his actions went from being verbal to now being physical. The way in which Crystal tells the story is that one evening she had invited Ronald over. They were in her bathroom taking a shower together, doing real grown folk stuff for 16 and 17. Just real grown. But anyway, he is washing her back in the shower and he notices some bruising. So he's like, what happened here? Like, what caused your back to be bruised? Girl, you looking like a turtle. At first, she said she didn't want to tell him the truth. She was just like, you know, it's nothing. Nothing really happened. But he started pressing the issue and he's like, no, something obviously happened. Like, what is it? She tells him a couple of nights ago, she's at the house with Cordell. He's there walking around and he propositions her for sex. Now, she declines respectfully. She tells him, you know, I'm not interested. No, thank you. 
and he responds by pushing her into a wall. So he pushed her so hard that her back hit the wall and now it's bruised because of that. And she says she did not want to tell Ronald because she was afraid of how he would respond and she just didn't want anything worse to happen. Now Ronald is pissed hearing this. He flies into a rage, he is upset, and he's really pissed because at this moment in time Cordell is not even there for him to approach him and confront him about it. So he tells Crystal next time this happens, anytime he puts his hands on you or just becomes a little extra call me like I'm not that far and I'll be here and I'll handle it she agrees to give him a call as soon as anything happens or goes down should it in the future and that's pretty much that for that situation on February 2nd of 1999 Crystal is at the apartment she's in the living living area common area with her friend Renee and they're sitting and talking, just enjoying each other's company. All of a sudden, Cordell comes home. Now, according to Crystal, when Cordell enters the apartment, not only does he make an inappropriate remark to her, he also makes a very inappropriate remark to her friend Renee. At this point, she and Renee decide, you know, let's just go to my room. So they go to her room, they chain up the door from the inside, locking themselves in, and Crystal calls Ronald. She tells him that Cordell, you know, he had said, xyz and we went to the room and now he's trying to kick the door in this crystal side of the story i'm just telling you what she said happened okay now a little backstory about cordell richards at this time he is a 31 year old line cook at a local restaurant those closest to him describe him as being very quiet very reserved he was very much an introvert he was very shy if i had not said that already didn't have many friends but the few friends that he did have they were extremely close and friends that he had had for years he actually joined the air force after high school he was a gulf war veteran he was also married with two daughters one daughter he'd had with his wife the other daughter his wife actually had already had from a previous relationship and after the two had gotten married he had actually adopted her and decided, you know, he was gonna be daddy and raise her as his own. Now, Cordell ended up living in this apartment because his wife decided not long after giving birth to their daughter that she didn't wanna be in the marriage anymore. She was not happy. She files for divorce and this completely devastates him. Like he was completely devastated and blindsided by the divorce because he didn't think that, you know, she wasn't happy and that their marriage wasn't a good one. So he was in a place where he was kind of sad about this. He was kind of adjusting to being and not having his wife there by his side. But he was still very much excited about being a father. And the two remained very close, he and his soon-to-be ex-wife. They did have a very good relationship. It was not toxic. It was not filled with drama. It's not like anything toxic had taken place between them. She just decided that... She no longer wanted to be in the relationship. He remains very, very much involved in his kids' lives and they speak very often until one day he just goes missing. She is calling, she's text, he doesn't respond to anything. After a couple of days go by and he does not respond, nor does he make any kind of attempt to contact her regarding their daughters or at least speak to them, she gets a little bit concerned. And she's not the only person that is concerned. Cordell enjoyed his job. He rarely missed work at all. He also had a friend that worked there. And after he does not show up for work, nor does he call in, the friend is also a little concerned. I mean, everybody down to the restaurant was concerned because Cordell was a very, very reliable employee the friend from his job contacts the local police and asks them to just perform a welfare check now see this is the thing i thought when you did a welfare check they just go on out there but apparently they do some calling around first to see if somebody didn't see you before they go out there and waste their time because they call the mother of his children and his current wife and she says that she has no idea where he could be and that um, it was kind of odd, you know, that she hadn't talked to him either. She does divulge some information about him that they find to be kind of interesting. She shares with them that he is experiencing a very tough financial hardship right now caused by an accident that had happened the year before. He had caused an accident, did not have insurance, tore up his car, tore up somebody else's car, and they sued him. And so now he was riding a bike everywhere, like to work or wherever he had to be, he was riding a bike back and forth. So she was a little concerned that maybe, you know, something had happened, maybe there was an accident. Police go out to the apartment to perform the welfare check. And the first thing that struck them as odd was the fact that the apartment they felt like didn't really look lived in. It was like a couple of pieces of memorabilia from him being in the Air Force. 
a lot of his clothes were like piled up in a corner in the living room and then there was his bike his bike was still there there doesn't appear to be any kind of like disturbances in the apartment they go to his bedroom nothing there no clues there telling them anything that would suggest that he had planned on up and leaving so they really aren't finding much of anything until they decide to go check the other bedroom which the door is very much locked honey they decide to just knock anyway just to you know just to see maybe somebody is gonna open and so they're surprised somebody does open a 17 year old boy answers the door and they see behind him 16 year old crystal sleeping in a sleeping bag and she waking up looking all groggy like what's going on the two of them identify themselves to police and they just pretty much tell them how they got there you know that sis needed a place to stay the cordell had the room available for rent they met up got the business squared away and she had just been living there for the past two months investigators tell them that cordell has gone missing he's been reported missing people are concerned and asked you know when's the last time you saw him now crystal tells them that no she has not seen him but that's not uncommon at all because considering their schedules like with work and school and all of the things that they had going on it's not uncommon for them to go weeks without seeing each other so she didn't think anything was weird by not having seen him lately the investigators are perplexed because nothing within the apartment suggested to them that anything had happened there was no foul play i mean they found crystal there but her story it kind of checked out especially considering the fact that they knew he needed some money it's not that far-fetched to believe that he allowed her to move in at this point they don't know where to look next for these answers they decide to go back to his friends and family to just ask more questions and really try to get a feel of the type of person that he was all of them pretty much gave the same story that he was just this reserved quiet guy who was down on his luck and kind of fell on hard times but even still considering his money troubles running away was not something that he would have done like that's completely out of character for him and none of them believed that that was simply the case that he just decided you know what I'm out of here and didn't tell anybody especially considering the fact that he loved his daughters and that he spent a lot of time with them no one believed that he just would have up and left them behind from there their missing persons investigation pretty much is put on ice like nothing else develops nothing happens no information nothing until a month after he is initially reported missing one month after his one month after he is reported missing police receive a frantic 911 call from a woman who is hysterical because her 12 year old child had just stumbled upon a body in the woods and it was quite a gruesome scene. Police immediately dispatch people out to the scene to check it out. When the detectives and the crime, crime scene crew, when they show up, they can't even just readily identify anything about the person. They don't know whether they're female or male, whether they're black, white, or anything in between. They take him down to the coroner's office and there is where they discover that this person has endured crazy torture. There were bones shattered, there were burns, like it was just, it was insane. Yet they had no way of identifying who this person was until luckily they catch a break when a deputy who was having lunch at the restaurant that Cordell worked at previously and they hear the employees talking about the details of how he just went missing and nobody ever found him it's been a month and nobody has still heard from Cordell and it's just so odd and so he goes down to the morgue and it's just like you know what I don't know if this is of any importance to y'all or if y'all have any John Doe's down here but I overheard this conversation. They decide to follow up on that tip and lo and behold, they make a positive identification. The man that they found is actually Cordell Richards. They released news that he had been found. They don't give too much detail though. And they just ask if anybody has any knowledge of what happened to him or if they have any information that they feel like is worth noting. So give them a call. Help us out. Y'all know we slow. Just kidding. Police then decide to revisit the apartment, this time looking a little deeper, a little closer. Now, when they get there, they also know that Crystal and her boyfriend, Ronald, are not there. It's obvious that they still live there, but they're just not there during this time. Detectives put Lumina all on the walls and on the floor, hit the lights, turn on the little blue light, the little black light, and 
child. It was very much obvious that something had happened there and that it had been cleaned up after the fact. And so they knew now that they were very much on to something. Crystal and Ronald immediately become their prime suspects. Something happened and these two are most likely involved. They leave a note for Crystal to give them a call when she returns home. Child, of course she didn't call. They had to have known she was not gonna call, child. Crystal probably saw that note and balled it up. Their suspicions that Ronald and Crystal had something to do with this were further solidified when they received a tip that a couple, while they were walking along this road that was, you know, alongside the wooded area, they saw this car parked there on the side of the road. Nobody was in the car at first. And then they see these three teens running from the woods. They hop in the car, speed off. The couple thought that was very odd, very weird, and they did not get the license plate, but they had a full description of the car, so they were able to get that, plus a little, little mild description of the three people. Police don't know who the hell the third person could be, but they are confident that two of three are, of course, Ronald and Miss Crystal. Police began questioning the close friends and family of both Ronald and of Crystal just to kind of get like a feel of who they are as people. The interviews really didn't get them anywhere but they did receive a break when they received another caller on the anonymous tip line. It's a man claiming that he believes his girlfriend's daughter mentioned being in the presence or in the apartment where a murder had taken place. Now he says that he really didn't think much about it until news broke that someone had been found. And so he was like, you know what? That might be what she was talking about. And if so, sis needs to go to jail. They ask him who his daughter is because of course they're still looking for the third teenager. And he tells them that she is 15 year old Renee Link. He describes her as a very troubled teen and said that she often ran away and would leave the house at night and they had no idea where she was and they pretty much don't put something like this past sis okay they need to look into her they call little old renee and her mother down to the police station and question them about this both of them deny that any conversation had ever taken place they don't know what he is talking about and they don't know anything about anything Renee admits to being acquainted with Cordell, but she claimed that she had no idea that anything had ever happened to him and she don't know what's going on. She tells them that she only knows him because he is her friend's roommate and she saw him a couple of times when she was hanging out at the apartment. Nothing more, nothing less. They question sis, but they have to let her go because they don't have any grounds to really just detain her at this moment. Then they receive another phone call. Like the tips are just rolling in. This time, there's a teen whose father is a police officer. And that teen had told her father that she felt like Ronald had something to do with this whole situation of Cordell. She actually said that she believed that all three of them, she gave Crystal and Renee's name as well. When she was brought down to the station and further questioned about this, she said that she had heard them talking about it. And she gave details about what they had done to Cordell that had not been released to the public. So they knew at that point that, you know, this was legit because only the person who was actually there would have known some of these things. At this point, detectives decide that it's time to pay Crystal's mother a little piece of a visit. They pull up at Crystal's mother's house and they didn't even have to go inside to get the tea because the tea was right there on the curb. They pull up and they see the car that the couple had described to them that they had seen teens hopping into and pulling off. And inside the car, Miss Crystal and Miss Ronald. Child, do you not watch the movies? When you're on the run, you don't go home, and you don't go to your mama's house. That's, that's, that's fugitiving one-on-one, -on -one. the act of being a fugitive. I mean, at least so I heard, because I ain't been a... Y'all, don't listen to me, shit. I ain't been no fugitive. They grab the two, pull them in for questioning, and they also call Renee down to the station. They put all three in their own interrogation room and decide that somebody's going to crack, okay? Somebody of the three is going to crack. But after they got to question in these girls and they all claim that they don't know what happened, they ain't have nothing to do with it, they realize that um probably won't be as soon or as easy as we thought because all three of them were claiming to not know anything about what happened to Cordell, period. They don't know. They ain't involved. After a couple of hours of interrogation and them not really giving anything, Crystal's parents find out that she's down at the police station. And so they come down and attempt to talk to her. 
they go right in and they're like look you know anything about what happened to this man you need to tell these people right now okay right now is the time to talk and at first she wasn't trying to hear that she was like i don't know anything i'm, I'm telling the truth but they know their daughter they know she lying so they tell her you know what it's gonna be easier on you a lot easier on you if you just go ahead and give them the story like let them know what really happened if you cooperate versus them having to find out the hard way that's gonna be even harsher on your sentencing which that's sometimes true but i don't think it's always the case and sis was like why do life when i get sentenced tonight okay she decided to tell them everything that had happened on the night that he had actually gone missing crystal decides to tell them everything that had happened leading up to her needing the apartment everything that had happened after she moved in all of the misconduct and inappropriate things that he had said and done and she tells him everything i didn't sat here and told you up until this point okay the point in which she calls ronald and tells him that cordell is trying to kick her door in ronald tells her not to leave the room he's on his way he shows up comes into the apartment he confronts Cordell immediately like as soon as he gets through the door Cordell is walking around and he confronts him and that leads to the two of them exchanging words the two of the men's argument escalates into something physical because Cordell pushes Ronald first and then he responds by pushing Cordell back and then he puts Cordell into a chokehold until he is unconscious Ronald then instructs Renee to go get some rope that was conveniently already there at the house at the apartment and she does that she brings it back then he instructs crystal to go get a baseball bat she said that when she returned ronald then told her to beat him with the bat and so she begins doing that and continues to do so until she gets tired cordell who is still very much unconscious is just laying there they go and get a sheet wrap him up in it and then put him in the car they drive out to a secluded wooded area and the three of them take him out of the car and carry him into the woods now at this point he has come to and he realizes like i'm in trouble he begins begging them to spare him like don't do anything else like i won't go to the police just let me go and they are not listening they refuse they instead decide that they're going to take turns hitting him as hard as they possibly can so they go around in a circle doing that once they get tired of doing that they decide that they're going to drag him even further into the woods and not only do they do that they take him and chain him to a tree at this point renee suggests that they burn him and ronald is like oh yeah that's a great idea he takes gasoline from the car and proceeds to pour it all over cordell and then he lights it now when cordell begins to scream the three of them run off and decide to leave him there the following day they return to the scene and see that cordell is still very much alive now initially he does not recognize that it's those three and so he is moaning in pain and he's asking for help like please you know call 911. ron approaches him kneels down and makes several attempts to like crack his neck but he is unable to like he, he couldn't do it they decide to leave the scene and go to a nearby store and purchase a meat cleaver now the three of them go inside make the purchase and return to the scene again and while cordell is screaming ron takes the meat cleaver and goes across his throat he then takes a bottle of sprite and pours it over the blade in an effort to clean it then they grab their receipt and return it to the store now after this happens crystal and ronald decide just them two by themselves they'll go and check out the scene again and when they get there they find that cordell literally is still alive like after all of this he is still very much alive once again faced with the opportunity to save this man's life they decide to make poor choice instead they decide to revisit the fire plan so they put more gasoline down and light it again and they leave now, police knew that their case against Renee was pretty weak. Even if they took Crystal's confession as the truth, 100%, her involvement was very limited. And they felt like they were not going to be able to get her for that many years anyway. So why not use this to their advantage? They took the 15 years that they feel like they might have, if they had gotten lucky, got her. And they decided to dress it up as a plea deal and present it to that girl. And they're like, look. 
we can help you get out of this. If you confess, we'll only give you these 15 years. You can be out at about 30 and still have a life. All she had to do was testify against the other two. And she actually agrees to do so, which pretty much seals the deal against the other two. When Ronald and Crystal go on trial in the year 2000, Little Miss Renee is the state's star witness against the other two. The prosecution's whole angle was that these two teens, like they were completely sadistic, they were terrible, horrible human beings, and they did this for two reasons. One, for their own pleasure and entertainment, and two, because they wanted that apartment all to themselves. Like they wanted to have his whole apartment because they couldn't apply and get an apartment somewhere else in their own names because they weren't old enough. They would just get rid of him and then have his apartment. Neither of their defenses really tried to argue any kind of innocence or you know that no this wasn't us instead they tried to use ronald and crystal's ages and all these accusations of misconduct on cordell's part as justification or like a for leniency i guess cordell who could not speak for himself obviously had plenty of people come as character witnesses on his behalf and all of them claimed that the things that crystal was describing that he had done was so far from his character like they were like, there's no way, like there's no way he would have done any of this. None of this is even remotely close to the person that he was. Now, despite their ages, Crystal receives a life sentence plus 30 years for kidnapping. Ronald received a death sentence actually. So he got a little, a little worse or he was about to because the judge considered that to be a little, well, not a little. The judge considered that to be inconstitutional because of his age. It was like, mm, that's a bit extreme. So he commutes it down to just life in prison. Honey, the two are hauled off right down to prison. They don't pass go, nor do they collect their little $200. However, in 2012, a U.S. Supreme Court ruling overturned both of their life sentences. The U.S. Supreme Court were kind of feeling like it was a bit unconstitutional. It was like cruel and unusual punishment to give life sentences to juveniles. The U.S. Supreme Court, they overturned all of these convictions to everybody who was given a life sentence as a minor and said that each one of them needed to be resentenced. The resentencing happened with one judge and it was completely up to his his sole discretion. If he heard your case and he felt like you didn't deserve a life sentence and that, you know, time credit was good enough, he literally was letting people go or if you had a life sentence and it's just like, mm, you shouldn't have got a life, but you should probably get 20, you'd have done eight. Okay, now you just have 12 more to go. Like that's how it was going. Their families were so hopeful for this. Like they were really feeling like, you know, our kids might be able to come home. So both their families attended their hearings, really hopeful that their child or loved one would be in that number of the ones who went to their resentencing and was told, you know what, time served is good enough, you can go free. Cordell's family also very anxiously awaited the outcome, fearing that these two might possibly walk free. They both go before the judge and ask for leniency, considering their ages at the time of the crime. Also considering the fact that they're now early 30s and they've literally spent half of their life or a little over half of their life in jail. Honey, the judge wasn't trying to hear, hear none of the things, okay? He rejects both of their requests for a lesser sentence and resentences them both to life in prison. Now, Miss Renee, the third wheel, she was released from prison after serving 12 years out of the 15 and since and since moved on with her life. And child, people was pissed about that. They were like, she's gotten out of jail. Yep, she has. That is pretty much it for this story. Mama said she was gonna take me out, honey. When I crossed 100K, I'm gonna have to call that girl and cash that in today because mother is hungry, okay? Mother is famished. I love y'all so much. Y'all really showed out, like for real. This last little stretch, I'm telling you, once I hit 98K, oh, y'all really weren't playing with the last thousand. Like the last thousand people came like that. So again, thank you to everybody. This is the thing. I've never been one of those people, content creators who will go under other people's videos and it's like, hey, I got a channel, check me out, check me out. Like, a lot of people don't like that. I don't really care. A lot of people don't like it though. YouTube now marks those kind of comments as spam now, so I guess they don't like it either. But my point is, I was not like, when I first started doing it, I wasn't even posting it to my social media. I just started posting it to social media not that long ago. 
I was trying to hide it from the people who knew me in real life. I'm like, girl, that ain't none of their business. Like, I don't want them watching me and judging me. I don't know. I felt weird about it. So I didn't really tell anybody about it. I was just here doing my thing, right? I said all that to say this. I feel like you guys did this. Like, your promoting my channel you're suggesting it to your friends your family whoever you suggested it to sharing my content liking commenting subscribing like all of that plays a part all of that really helps to promote your channel and so i just want to thank y'all because y'all really got me here like for real this was this was y'all you know mother knows she's the talent but y'all are the team girl beyonce can't do all of that by herself you know what i'm saying it takes a village. Y'all are, are my village. I love y'all. Shout out to everybody who is new. Welcome to all the new people. I know y'all probably like, girl, what's going on over here? It gets a little ratchet, but that's okay. Because it's also a judgment-free zone, okay? Now, before I go, I do want to say that I'm going to have a virtual meet and greet to celebrate 100K. Because, you know, I told y'all we was going to do a live. It was going to be a party. All of the things is still going to be all of that, okay? I'll let y'all know what day. I'm thinking about Saturday, but I don't want to make no promises. So I'm not sure if it'll be Saturday or not. I don't know if I want to wait on my play button to come in the mail or not. I'll let y'all know. I'll keep y'all posted. But yeah, we're going to have a whole virtual meet and greet and it's going to be a good time. As always, I genuinely appreciate you spending time with me. And I look forward to seeing or hearing your thoughts down below. Y'all be safe out there. Enjoy your weekend. And I will see you on Tuesday. Peace. That last little stretch of 2000, baby. It's like y'all are out passing out flyers down to the line for Jordans on a Saturday morning. Or down at the courthouse. In the summer of 1998, Ronald meets a 15 year old girl. Is she 15? That's a match made in hell, honestly. A Pisces and Aries. It might be a couple watching right now that's just like, one of them probably like, girl, aren't we in love? The other one is like, she sure know what to say. Either a night and all, either a, oh. Now a little backstory about Cri Crystal. I was gonna call him Crystal. Being very, blah, 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 blah. Police receive, receive what? Police receive an anonymous tip. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't all that anonymous actually. Renee Lux, that is not her name like links or something her if she knowed knowed did i really just say if she knowed i'm disgusted with myself honestly two jumping into and draw dry, dry, when you're on the run you don't go home you <coughs> choking on a damn spray i'm so sick of this like girl don't remind me to breathe i'm breathing 24 7 the apple watch always want to tell me to breathe baby i'm breathing all day you're late to the store they get unknown caller baby i'm busy considered to be un what is the word what is it considered to be cruel and usual pure cruel cruel and unusual not cruel and usual i genuinely genuinely what what was i about to say girl genie what